Okay, uh, great. Um, welcome to the class. Uh, uh, super, uh, super exciting week, week with some uh, really exciting topics uh, for us to cover. So, now for the topic for today. We are going to talk about uh, recommender systems and we are also going to talk about how can graph learning be applied to uh, recommender systems. And before I kind of start, we are going to look even what is a recommendation si recommender system task, how it's defined and how do we uh, evaluate it. But the main motivation for recommendation is that in this, uh, mainly in the online world where you can basically have huge inventory of things and the inventory of things that you have is not limited by you know, some kind of physical store, something that user can navigate or a library, but you can essentially have unlimited inventory. The, the problem then becomes how do people find things they are looking for or things that they like? And usually, right, like when you say I want people to find, one option is that they explicitly tell you what they want and you, you give it to them. That is a search engine type metaphor. Um, but another m type of a metaphor is also that you want to see what, the, what things the user has consumed in the past and based on that you want to recommend new things new, new, that the user was not aware but might be suitable for the user. And you can think of anything from movies in Netflix to products in, in Amazon to, to music to videos to pins um, and, and many, many other things. Right? And, the point of this is that we want these things to be personalized, right? They, they should be different for, for every human because different humans are different, they have different needs, uh, different tastes and so on, right? So we want to suggest a small number of interesting items to each user um, and this is kind of critical from user satisfaction uh, point of view and the utility they get out uh, uh, of that uh, platform, service, uh, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever it is, okay? And the way we can model recommender systems as a graph, we can, uh, we can model them as a bipartite graph where we have users on one side and we have items on the other side. And what you can also do um, many times do and basically all big, um, especially e-commerce companies have huge efforts that they build a knowledge graph on this side, right? You can think about here how the knowledge graph can extend if these are movies, what are properties of the movies, cate categories, actors, genres, and so on, and you can have a knowledge graph on this side. What you can also do on the user side is that it's not only that you know user and the items the user uh, interacted, uh, let's say purchased or, or browsed, but also you have other information about the user, other behavior on the site that you can kind of enrich with the graph on, on the, on the, uh, on the um, uh, left hand side, right? So, the, but the most simple representation is that you have users and items and uh, an edge means that a user has, let's say, consumed uh, that given item, right? So uh, the edge indicates some kind of user item interaction, maybe a click, maybe a purchase, maybe a review. Um, and it's often associated with a timestamp because this interaction between a user and an item happened at, at a particular point in time. So the, the, the most kind of general way to, to write out the recommender system task is that we have some users and we have some items and we have some of this information, these interactions known from the past. Um, and the task is that we want to predict new items uh, each user is going to interact with in the future, right? Um, and this, we can think of this as a link prediction problem, right? Where we want to predict new, new user item interaction edges uh, based on the past edges, right? So for a given user U and for a given uh, item V, we need to get a real valued score that would kind of say what is the utility of this user with respect to that uh, item. And item can be something very abstract, can be a product, can be a movie, can be a restaurant, can be a dish at a restaurant, can be a, a movie director, can be a, a taxi ride, can be a decision whether you want to order food or you want to take a taxi ride or you want some other service. So a lot of different things you can think about something recommending something to the user and trying to anticipate what the user is going to do. A modern recommender system 
is a uh, is kind of is a is a is a big is a big system. It has many components and. One of the main problems is that many times, like in reality, we cannot evaluate this function f, this utility function, for every user item pair, right? Like you cannot show up to the Amazon web page and in 50 milliseconds score how likely are you to be interested at this time, you know, on Tuesday at 3.09 p.m. Uh, for each of the 100 million products they have or how many even more and then show you top 20 or somehow decide what to show you. Right, so usually the way this works is that you have a two-stage process. So you have what they call candidate generation and then you have a ranking. And the candidate generation, the idea is that basically you, you use the user as a query into your uh, database of items and you retrieve um, the closest, uh, the most relevant items, maybe 100, maybe 1,000 of them. And then you come with a big fat um, ranking uh, stage that now scores every of those thousand items with respect to the user. And in a recommender system, usually you would have a lot of different candidate generators and that, that look at various aspects and then you'd have, uh, let's say, one scoring function. So in the, in the embedding world, when we work with embeddings, the idea is that you basically ha use, you somehow embed a user and the embedding of the user is your query. And then you have a KNN means K nearest neighbor engine, where you basically take this embedding of the query and you say, what are 100 or 1,000 nearest item embeddings to the embedding of the user? And you retrieve those. So this is like a high dimensional search engine. It's actually the way, the way this works, it, uh, uh, it's interesting. The, the, the state of the art methods for retrieval, these nearest neighbor engines are graph based, called uh, HNSW is the method. Hierarchical small world networks is the method, right? But you, you retrieve here from millions, tens of millions, billions of items. You have your candidates, and now you are scoring these thousand candidates with respect to the user, and then return, let's say, top 10. And really, in reality, you never return top 10 because out of the highest ranking ones, you're like, which ones has the user seen yesterday? Aha, uh -huh, those I throw away. I want some diversity. So I'll show, you know, five, uh, five examples of this side and uh, of this type, and I'll show another five examples of that type. And somebody is paying me to show that item, so it's an ad, and I'll throw that in there. So there is a lot of, there's a lot of logic that goes on in here from, you know, you scoring to actually user seeing it. But, you know, that's maybe, uh, if you are interested more in this next quarter, I'll be teaching two, uh, CS246, and we'll talk more in depth about recommender systems. But it's, it's a super fascinating area. Okay? So search, and then I recommend. Okay? So the point is that for each user, we want to recommend in this kind of uh, k items, where k is, let's say, 10 or 100, right? And we rec uh, the recommendation to be effective, k needs to be much smaller than the total number of items I have in my database, right? So usually we recommend, let's say, 10 items to the user, and then see what the user does with the 10 items, and as soon as the user scrolls, we recommend the next 10. And the user scrolls and the next 10, because we want to be very real time. We want to be very responsive to the user. It makes no sense to use, yes, you know, a, a, your engagement from last week to materialize recommendations for next week. It's, it, it's stale. So we want to be kind of responsive, right? Uh, and the goal is to include as many of these positive items as possible in the, into the K, uh, top K recommended items. So what do I mean here is that a positive item is item that the user will interact with in the future. Right, so the idea is that basically I want to predict what items you are going to, uh, to interact with next week. And uh, I want today to guess as many of those items as possible. The evaluation metric that people would, call, uh, would call, talk about is they would call it recall at K or they would call hits at K. So out of top K items that you recommended, how many has the user actually interacted with in the next time period? So the way you can think of this is that for every user, P sub U is a set of positive items that the user will interact in the future, right? Now, of course, you can say, okay, how do I know what the user will interact in, in the future? The way you know it is that you pretend that today is February 1, and then you look what the user does in the week of February 1st to February 2nd, right? So you, you go into the history and you hide the future from yourself and see, can you predict that future? That's the way you know what the user will do, right? 
Um, and let R sub u be the set of items recommended by our model. Right, so the top k recommendations. Um, right, that, that, um, uh, and we wanna, um, items that the user has already uh, interacted with, we wanna exclude. So the point is that um, we wanna maximize the size of the intersection, right? We want uh, out of the items to recommend, that we recommend as many of them as possible to be the ones that the user has uh, uh, interacted with in the, in, the, uh, in the future. So this is called recall, recall at k, and it's simply the intersection between these two sets divided by uh, the, the fraction of positive, uh, positive items. And the higher value indicates that more positive items are recommended uh, to the user. Um, and the final recall is computed by averaging the recall values across all users, right? So the unit of recommendation is a user. It's, a, it's I'm recommending it to a user, I'm recommending it in a session, okay? So um, this is what I want to say kind of from what is the goal of a recommender system. So now let's talk about embedding based methods for recommender systems. The notation I'm going to use is the following. U is a set of users. V is a set of uh, items, and E is a set of observed user item interactions, right? So in some sense, a set of edges between uh, users and items, where you, an edge means that user U interacted with item V. So now, you know, what is an interaction? In this uh, simplified case, let's assume an interaction is I bought an item, I liked an item, something of that sort, right? Some positive action that I did. Uh, with the item, I watched the movie, and so on, right? And then, um, yeah, this is kind of domain specific and very important how you define this positive interaction, right? With the movie, you'd usually say, oh, you watched 80% of the movie, um, and, and so on, okay? So that's, uh, uh, that's what we say. And now, what is the scoring function? The scoring function is we wanna get the top k items. So we need to a score function that scores a user comma item um, and gives me a score. So um, I'll write it this way, score between a user and an item. Um, and I'm going to return the, the k items with the largest scores for a given user, right? Again, excluding already interacted items, uh, at the time of recommendation, right? So the idea is that for a given user, I'm going to score all possible items, here are their scores, and, I, and then I'm going to return uh, top k, where k is uh, some uh, hyperparameter, okay? That's what's conceptually happening. Um, and a, me and a, w a method that works really, really well are, are based on embeddings. And the reason these methods work really well is because usually you have a lot of these uh, this interaction data. And because you have a lot of this interaction data, you can really learn this kind of optimal embeddings about of users and items, so you can then um, uh, learn basically their different aspects and make good recommendations. So for our case, for every user, we are going to have a, a d-dimensional embedding, and for every item, we are going to have a d-dimensional embedding. And then I'm going to have some scoring function f, parameterized by this parameter theta, that is, you know, going to take embedding of the user, embedding of the item, and will return me a score, okay? And that will be, uh, in some sense, a utility uh, that, uh, of a user with respect to a given item. Um, and this means that embedding-based methods are going to have three types of parameters that I'll need to learn or estimate. I need an encoder to generate user embeddings. I need, a way, I need a set of parameters or an encoder to generate item embeddings. And then I also need a parameter theta of this scoring function. So I can learn a scoring function, I learn the embeddings of users and embeddings of uh, items. And the training objective is that I wanna optimize the model parameters to achieve high recall at k uh, on scene uh, user item interactions, on the training user item interactions, right? And the hope is that this objective would also lead to high uh, recall at k for the unseen uh, future uh, interactions. That's, that's kind of the, the, what we are trying to achieve. There is one problem with this recall at k. The problem is that this original objective function is non-differentiable, right? You cannot, I cannot apply gradient-based learning to it. I cannot apply optimization methods to it. So that's a problem. So what, what you do in practice is that people have developed two surrogate uh, loss functions that are widely used and enable efficient gradient-based learning, right? Basically, I can do backpropagation, I can use SGD, uh, Adam, and so on, 
right? And there are two ways how people do this. One is called the binary loss, and the other one that's better is called Bayesian personalized ranking loss, or BPR. So I'll explain this one quickly and then the, the, uh, and what the problem is with binary loss, and then I'll show you the BPR. Um, the point is that these surrogate losses are differentiable, um, and uh, they, you know, in some sense should align well with the original training objective of that, or training goal of re optimizing for recall at K. So what is a binary loss? A binary loss really define positive and negative uh, edges. You know, a set of positive edges E are the observed training user item interactions. So this is what the user is going to interact with in the future. And then we have a set of negative edges, which are interactions that are not going to happen uh, in the future. Okay, now how do you select this um, becomes very important um, in practice because um, you won't be able to use all non-existent interactions as negatives. Um, and uh, you have to be careful how you select negative examples, right? If I'm, uh, you know, really excited about baking, then if you pick 100 random Amazon products as negative examples, probably none of them will be about baking. You know, there'd be a car, there'd be a toy, there'd be, I don't know, some dress and so on. It'd be very easy to say, oh yeah, Yure is not interested in that, he really is into baking, right? Uh, it will be too easy. So there is, um, as I'll show you towards the, towards the end for some, let's say, commercial um, uh, recommender systems that are deployed, there is a lot of uh, thinking that goes into this negative uh, example selection. Now that I defined E and E negative, I'll just define a sigmoid function. A sigmoid function is a function that takes an input on the real axis and squishes it between zero and one. So why do we like sigma function? Because now if things are on zero and one, I can interpret this as a probability, okay? So that's, that's all. It takes a real axis and squishes it in in a, in a, um, in a bijective way to an interval zero in one, right? So maps real valued scores into something that can be interpreted as a binary likelihood score, right? Like as a probability. So a binary loss is the following, right? It's a, it's a, a binary classification of positive negative edges using my scoring function uh, F. So it's basically a cross entropy loss. That's another way, right? So I'm saying here are my uh, positive edges. It's a sum over my positive edges and it's the, the log, the log uh, sigmoid of the score. So it's basically the log probability, right? I'm just multiplying or summing up these log probabilities for edges that actually occur. So I will want this to be um, as, uh, as small as possible, right? And then um, I go here over the negative edges, so the edges that did not appear. What I want to maximize uh, here, I wanna do one minus the probability of an edge, right? So really I want these uh, this, uh, scores to be as small as possible so that you know, uh, something, if it's small, as negative as possible, then a sigmoid of that will be close to zero. Um, one minus something close to zero will be close to one. Log of one is zero, right? So that's, that's what I want. I want these uh, log terms to be as small as possible, and I want uh, these, these terms to be as, as big as possible, as close to one as possible. While here, I want this as, as close to zero um, as, as possible, right? And that, that means that this uh, uh, binary loss pushes the scores of positive examples higher than those of uh, negative examples or negative edges. And this aligns well with our recall metric, right? We want the interactions in the future to get high score and the negative interactions to get a uh, low score. One detail is that usually um, during training, these terms, you don't really go over uh, all the positive edges and all the negative edges, but you create mini batches, right? And uh, you can basically approximate this loss by using mini batches of positive and negative examples. And, and many times people would maybe sometimes change, only maybe have one positive example in a mini batch and a lot of negative examples. And sometimes because sampling negative examples can take a lot of time, you would even use the same set of negative examples across a few mini batches and then refresh them. So there's a lot of tricks that people do to make this work for you know, hundreds of millions, billions of uh, users or items. The issue with this binary loss is that it scores uh, all, 
all positive edges and, and uh, tries to push them high and it pushes all the negative edges uh, low, right? What do I mean by here? This is over all edges UV and this is over all edges UV, right? So the problem is it tries to put all positive edges high and all negative edges low. Uh, but this would kind of unnecessarily penalize a model predictions even if the training recall metric is perfect, okay? So let me show you an example of what I mean by this. What I mean is the following. Imagine I have two users and two items. And imagine user one, uh, user zero likes item zero and user uh, one likes item one. And imagine my scoring function would say there is a score four on this edge and a score of two on the other edge, okay? So um, uh, uh, here, right? So it means that the, the pink edge is ranked higher than the edge between one and item zero. And for the user zero, the edge between user zero and item zero is, has score one, and the other, the other edge to the item uh, one has a score of minus one. So this would be a perfect recall. But if you look at what the, the training law, the binary loss would do, it would penalize you because you have ranked uh, uh, this negative edge, you gave it a score of two, while that positive edge has a score of one. So you would receive, uh, you would receive penalty, right? So the problem is that binary loss would still penalize the model because the negative uh, edge has a higher score than this uh, positive edge, even though they come from different users. And if you look at each user individually, the ranking of the edges is actually correct, okay? So that's the problem with the binary loss. So the, the, the insight is that the binary loss is non-personalized in a sense that positive negative edges are considered ac across all users at once, right? Um, but the recall metric that I defined is inherently personalized. It's per user recall, right? Um, and uh, uh, in some sense, this uh, uh, non-personalized uh, uh, binary loss is kind of overly stringent for measuring personalized uh, recall metric. So a suitable alternative to this that makes this fix is, um, is a loss function that basically is uh, personalized. What do I mean by this is that for each user, we want the scores of the positive items to be above the scores of the negative items. For each user separately, regardless of what is the magnitude of the scores uh, for one user versus the other user, right? We don't, core the, 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 we don't care about the ordering of scores across users. And the BPR, the Bayesian personalized ranking loss, achieves this. So let me show you what this uh, loss is. So um, one thing, here's a note, this BPR was, was uh, invented back in 2009. Um, and at that point in time, they, they called it Bayesian because they had some Bayesian priors uh, as part of their model. But it turns out you don't really, that the key innovation was not the Bayesian priors, but was this uh, personalized ranking. And people still call it Bayesian personalized ranking, even though it's the personalized ranking that is important here. Okay, so just to explain why Bayesian is there, even though it kind of shouldn't be. Um, so the point being is that this loss is personalized surrogate loss that aligns well with this recall at K. And the way it works is the following, is that for every user, we will now define a set of positive and negative edges, right? So rather than saying here are all the positive edges and here are all the negative edges, now we are going to have positive and negative set for every user. So um, now notice that I have a set of positive edges that is a function of the user and a set of negative edges that is a function of the user. Okay, before we just said there are negative edges, now this negative set will be different depending on what, what user I'm, I'm thinking about, okay? So this is, and notice here when I give the definitions, I always kind of condition on this, on this user. I say these are the positive interactions of this given user and these are the non-interactions or negative edges of this given user, okay? So the, the training objective then is that for each user u star, we want scores um, of the rooted positive edges, rooted in a sense that the that left-hand side of the edge is fixed, the user is fixed, to be higher than those of the rooted negative edges, right? Um, and the way you write this down is here, where I'm saying I'm going over every possi positive edge 
and every negative edge for a given user. And then here I'm saying for a positive edge, it has to be ranked higher than all the negative edges, right? Because I take a positive edge and then I go over all the negative edges and here I take the difference in ranking. This is the positive uh, and this is a negative, right? So now if the score, if the score um, of, the, of the positive guy is always bigger than the score of any negative uh, uh, edge for, uh, for, a given, uh, for, a given, for a given user, then this difference will be positive. Then this sigma, this sigma it will give me something that is uh, above, above uh, zero um, and uh, uh, things will, uh, things will uh, work out, okay? So the final BPR loss will be, um, will be, will be one, one over number of users and then you are kind of summing this loss uh, over all the users where the loss is defined here. And then again, um, the, the, uh, the point here is that you can approximate this again using mini batches and so on. But the key is that you are now comparing the difference between a positive interaction and a negative one for a fixed user, okay? And only then you sum up or average uh, over all the users you have, okay? Um, now, one thing about this BPR loss that I, that I wanna say is that in practice you wanna do this over mini batches. So this means that um, we sample a subset of users U for a given, for a given mini batch. And then for uh, each user, we sample one positive item um, in, uh, for, for each user in the mini batch, we sample one positive item um, and a set of negative items, okay? Um, and then in the, the mini batch, the loss would be computed uh, as, as follows, right? So this is, I average over all the users in the mini batch. Um, I go over the negative edges and I'm saying the difference, I'm, I have this difference between the user's positive item, there is only one, and a set of negative items uh, for that fixed user, okay? So now I have one positive and a set of negatives for, uh, for, every, for every user in that mini batch. And whenever the, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, in the next mini batch, I may have the, sa the same user, but I'll have a different positive item and a different set of uh, negative items. Uh, that's the idea. So let me summarize what we have learned so far. We have learned that this recall at K is a metric for personalized recommendation. Um, and uh, we talked that there are uh, th basically the way you could build a recommender system is that basically that you would learn three types of parameters. This could be shallow embeddings, a user encoder, item encoder, and a scoring function. Um, and I showed you the surrogate loss functions, uh, either a binary or uh, this uh, personalized ranking loss that basically allow you now to optimize the loss in order for you to learn these parameters. Um, and generally in this recommender system benchmarks, so this is benchmarks, the embedding based models have a achieved a kind of state of the art performance. Uh, so now I wanna explain why do they work so well in this, um, in this uh, benchmarks. Question. Why are you always sampling many more negative edges than positive? Why, why am I always sampling many more negative edges than uh, positive edges? Uh, because the, the problem is really um, uh, imbalanced, right? In a sense that, that um, uh, in a sense that, I don't know, Netflix has, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of movies. My, uh, Amazon has, I don't know, a billion products and you only interact with a very small number of them. So, so it's not a 50-50, it's, it's a very tiny. So you want, you, you need a lot of negative examples to kind of push away the positive one. Uh, what's the issue like empirically with the non-personalized loss? Is it that it's wasted compute or is it that like the best performance you could get is not going to be as good with the binary versus BPR? Uh, good question. So what is the problem with the, with the binary loss? Uh, in, in practice, what happens is that the binary loss, I mean, in some sense, it's harder to optimize. Um, and it kind of lets the, the model focus on, on kind of on wrong things, right? Yes, if you'd have an all powerful model, then you'd say, yeah, I'll use binary because it forces my model to even learn more. But in reality, your data is noisy, your model is imperfect. 
So now you are trying to force model to learn something that you don't really care about. So it's better to have a personalized loss because it really tells the model what you really care about and the model is going to use the modeling power to separate out items for a given user rather than make items comparable across users. That's kind of the key why one is better than the other. But uh, good point, yeah, thank you, yes. Uh, for the negative edge choices, uh, do you want the negative edges to be closer to your required uh, sample or do you want them to be like very distant? Great, like yeah, uh, good question. How do I select negative edges? I'll, I'll, I have slides at the end where I'll show you how, how to do this properly. But the idea is the following. The idea is that if you pick random things, then, and you know, my, my baking example, right? Then it becomes too easy um, for the model to learn because it's really saying, oh, here is baking and there's everything else, right? But if you think about these candidate generators, they really need to pick the, not out of all baking items, but you know, maybe I like, you know, whatever, making cookies that look cats and dogs, right? So you want to recommend me, uh, I don't know, cooking stuff that makes cats and dogs. I, I'm making this up as I go, so let's see where it takes me, you know? But, but what I'm trying to say is, it's important to force the model to really give you those good items in the top 100 out of a billion. So you are really learning to push the good stuff all the way to the top and all the irrelevant stuff to the bottom. So the point is, if you have negative, random negatives, it's too easy for the model to learn and it's too much noise at the top, so it never learns. So what you can then do is to start introducing what is called hard negative examples, right? So kind of, you know, baking stuff that is not cats and dogs. So that you really learn how to personalize baking stuff for me because I'm in a very, I know, specific type of baking, right? So, so that's, that's, that's what I mean by that. And I'll show you something that is called, uh, is called uh, distance-based sampling where you wanna kind of, when you sample negative examples, you wanna make sure you sample them kind of evenly across the embedding distances. Because if you sample randomly, you know, you are like sampling from far away and it's easy. If you sample too close, then you confuse the model because you give it points that are very similar, but you don't tell it that those, all these other things are irrelevant. So you kind of have to sample across the range of distances. That's the, that's the intuition. I'll make this more precise at the end. Yes, go ahead. Always a single user, or this, let's say a few users living in the same household, they may buy similar item. Do you, is that possible that you will consider a subset of the nodes instead of one single node? Uh, good question. So, your question is about what, what about people who share passwords? Right, that's basically, or you know, people that use the same account, either Amazon or Netflix and so on. So, the way you would do this is you'd, you'd try to model that heterogeneity kind of um, separately outside. You either try to identify that the user is heterogeneous and kind of split the user into a couple of nodes. You'd like maybe to, to, to very quickly try to identify what identity of the user you are working with. It's a very hard, I would say, use case specific, specific problem if behind the same identity there's actually multiple, multiple individuals or multiple different tastes, okay? Uh, good, um, so why do embedding, uh, thank you for the questions, uh, let me continue um, and please ask me more, right? So um, why do embedding uh, systems work? Um, and there is this super powerful intuition for recommender systems that's called collaborative filtering. And basically the collaborative filtering, the idea is that by, by that if you uh, recommend items for a user by collecting preferences of other similar users, you will do really, really well, right? In a sense that similar users tend to prefer similar items, right? If you and I watch 20 movies uh, in common on Netflix, then probably the 21st movie we will watch will also be very similar, right? So if I watch 20 movies and you watch 21, and all the first 20 are the same, then a very good recommendation is to say, whatever is your 21st movie, that's uh, my 21st movie. That's, that's the idea of collaborative filtering, where you can basically say two users are similar if they interacted with a lot of uh, same items, and then you just look what, what the other user has interacted with that the first one hasn't yet. And that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's a very good recommendation uh, that you would come up with here. And these embedding-based graph-based methods do exactly that, right? They will, because 
uh, these two users have interacted with similar items, they will have similar embeddings. Um, so whenever you, you uh, and uh, this particular it user and that particular item will have a high score because this is a positive edge. So it means the user U and this particular item will also likely have a high score. That's kind of this uh, um, uh, collaborative filtering intuition. Right, so the key here is how do we capture similarity between users and items? Um, and, and embedding based models basically allow you to capture this uh, really well. Because low dimensional embeddings cannot, are basically forced to generalize in a sense that they cannot simply uh, capture all the user item interaction data, right? And the embeddings are forced to kind of learn this implicit similarity between users and items. And this allows the models to make effective prediction uh, on unseen user item interactions, right? If your embedding dimensionality is too large, then basically you can just memorize the edges and you don't wanna do that. So what you do is you make the embedding dimensionality a bit smaller to kind of force the model to identify these similarities between, uh, between users and items. So what I wanna tell uh, in the remaining of the lecture is actually show you a few GNN based methods for recommender systems, right? What we learned so far was you can just do shallow embeddings of users and shallow embeddings of items. The problem with that is, for example, is that it's transductive um, and that uh, you need to learn this, uh, you need to learn these embeddings. I'm now going to show you uh, three methods, uh, the neural graph collaborative filtering, the light GCN, which is kind of a simplification. And then I'll tell you about this um, paper called PinSage that, used, that showed how to use GNNs to make high quality uh, embeddings uh, for recommendations. And this is actually, these are the first two are uh, kind of research papers. This is also a research paper, but it's a deployed system. Uh, so um, it's kind of a lot of practical uh, tips on how to make uh, things work and what really matters, okay? So let's start with neural collaborative filtering. So the conventional collabor uh, filtering, collaborative filtering is, is based on these shallow encoders, which so means shallow embeddings. We have no user, no item features, um, and uh, we only, you know, basically for every user and item, we prepare a shallow learnable, uh, learnable embedding, right? We just directly learn the embedding, and usually the scoring function, people just use the dot product. Usually the scoring function is just a dot product between the embedding of the user and the embedding of the item. Because it's then easy to do the nearest neighbor search uh, if you have a very simple uh, scoring function, okay? So that's uh, the way people uh, usually do it. Um, but the problem with these shallow encoders is that this does not explicitly capture the graph structure. Um, and the graph structure is only implicitly captured as part of the training uh, objective. So uh, what, you know, the researchers in the paper say that only kind of the first order graph structure, the edges is captured in the training objective. And the question is, could you kind of capture a bit more of the graph structure explicitly beyond just individual edges? Um, so the motivation is that we want a model that explicitly captures the graph structure um, beyond just the, the training objective and that captures kind of more, bigger region of the graph rather than just each edge kind of individually. And here, the GNNs are a natural approach to this. And as I said, I'll talk about the neural graph collaborative filtering and then uh, a method called uh, uh, light, uh, light GCN that's a simplified version of the first method. Um, but the neural collaborative filtering explicitly incorporates higher order graph structure when generating user and item embeddings. And the key idea is to use GNN to generate graph aware user item embeddings. In the initial step, we learn shallow embeddings of users and items. This is what I showed you to do so far. And then what this paper proposes is to use a GNN to propagate the embeddings um, and, and make them more graph aware. So what this means is that use now a GNN to kind of enrich an embedding of every user and item through the embeddings of nearby uh, users and items. And you kind of smooth these embeddings across the graph a bit, you enrich them and you get um, better performance uh, for that reason, okay? So the way this works is we are given user item uh, bipartite graph 
um, we, pre we, le we prepare shallow learnable embedding for every node. And then we use a multi-layer GNN to propagate embeddings uh, across this uh, bipartite graph. Um, and then, in this sense, final embeddings are explicitly uh, graph aware. Uh, there are two kinds of learnable parameters that are jointly learned, the shallow user item embeddings, as well as the parameters uh, of the GNN, right? So here, the way we would do it, we would not first train the, um, the shallow embeddings and then the GNN, but we would kind of do it one after the other, right? Like we would basically do them in a coordinate descent type of way. Um, so that we learn both uh, at the same time, okay? Um, now, about the initial node embeddings, we set a shallow learnable embeddings uh, that are, uh, um, uh, in that basically are initial node features or node embeddings for every user, for uh, every, uh, every item, we initialize this uh, embedding. And then we iteratively update node embeddings using this kind of uh, neighborhood embeddings. Where you say the, the embedding of a given node at the next uh, iteration is a combination of the embedding of the same node at the previous iteration plus aggregation of the uh, embeddings of neighbors. Um, and here we have uh, two, uh, we are um, uh, combining uh, from items uh, and we are combining uh, from, uh, from users, right? Um, and different architectural choices are possible for the aggregation and combination. Aggregation could be mean uh, and combine can simply be like concatenation and some, uh, um, some linear layer um, and, and, and then a non-linearity, right? So there's a, lo a lot kind of flexibility how exactly uh, you, implement, uh, you implement this part, okay? And then, you know, what are the final embeddings and the score function? After k rounds of this neighborhood aggregation, we get a final embedding uh, h, uh, h, uh, uh, h of u of, uh, of k, and also the h of the item at k. And then uh, what do we do? I say the embedding of the user is simply the embedding at the, at the last iteration, and the embedding of the item is the embedding at the last iteration. And then score function, what people like to use is just the dot product between the embedding of the user and the embedding uh, of the item. Um, so to summarize what this uh, neural graph collaborative filtering does, it's a conventional collaborative filtering method uses a shallow user item embeddings, um, kind of, and doesn't explicitly model the graph structure. So the N uh, GCF uses a GNN to propagate shallow embeddings across the graphs, um, and embeddings are explicitly aware of kind of higher order uh, graph structure because of this propagation. That's the that's the key um, innovation here that you get the benefit of shallow embeddings, but also um, some smoothness or propagation of the shallow embeddings across the graph using this learnable GNN. Okay, that's the, that's the idea here. Um, so that's the, the, the first method. I don't know, do people have any questions? Or shall I show you the kind of a simplified version of this? Okay, I'll show you, I'll show you a simplified and then please ask me a question, okay? So the, the next method I wanna show is called uh, uh, Light GCN uh, and was also uh, developed uh, with recommender systems uh, in mind. So here is how, how to think of this, right? The, the, the uh, neural graph collaborative filtering joins, jointly learns two kinds of parameters, the shallow user item embeddings and the, the GNN uh, parameters. Uh, the observation is that these shallow learnable embeddings are kind of already quite expressive, right? They are learned for every user and every item uh, separately. Um, and if you look at where, where are the free parameters, most of the free parameters are in the shallow embeddings where the number of, of items, nodes, uh, users is much bigger than the embedding dimensionality, right? Because the amount of parameters in the, sh um, in the shallow embedding is n times d, and the GNN will have kind of d squared number of parameters, right, the, the, um, uh, or that order, right? So there is much more modeling power here than here. So um, what the intuition is that maybe this GNN 
uh, parameters are not so uh, essential in this. So the question is, can we simplify the GNN part um, and uh, maybe make uh, the model uh, more, uh, more efficient, easier to learn? And the answer is yes. And what people have also found is that actually it gives you a slight boost um, in performance, uh, again, on benchmarks as well. So let's take a look at uh, how does this work. We, the idea goes as follows. We are going to have an adjacency matrix for the bipartite graph. And I'm going to use the matrix formulation of the GCN, of the graph convolutional neural network, right? Uh, this is, I don't know, lecture four, five, something like that, right? Uh, Jeshwan was talking about this Le uh, matrix formulation of a GCN. Um, and then we are actually going to simplify the GCN by removing nonlinearity. Um, and this is similar to this method um, that is called SGC. Um, that is for scalable GNNs. And I think uh, this lecture will come uh, next week or in two weeks. Okay, so we are going to learn about this and the, the, two, the two ideas are uh, related. So let me now tell you about this light, light, uh, light GCN. So we are going to take the adjacency matrix of an undirected bipartite graph. So the way the, way the adjacency matrix of a bipartite graph looks like, there are two blocks of zeros because items don't link to items and users don't link to users. But there are non-zero non -zero, uh, entries here and here. And one is uh, the transposed version of the other because the graph is, by, is, is um, undirected, okay? Here, ruv is one if the user u interacts with item v um, and zero uh, otherwise. Um, and then we also have an embedding matrix that has the embeddings of all the users and the embeddings of all the items. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the setting. So now I, I show you, uh, 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 try to kind of uh, remind you what was the matrix formulation of a, of a GCN. Um, and the key concept here is this notion of a diffusion matrix. Um, and another connection between the lecture today and what we are going to talk about now is the connection to this correct and smooth method that was, I don't know, lecture nine or something, um, where we talked about this uh, semi-supervised correct, correct and smooth method that was propagating the labels across the graph. And uh, the key concept there was this notion of uh, diffusion matrix, where we have D to be a degree matrix. So this is a diagonal matrix that has degrees of nodes on the diagonal. Um, and then we define this uh, A tilde as a, a normalized adjacency matrix to be, the, uh, to, to be the, um, the degree matrix times the adjacency matrix times the, the properly processed uh, uh, de degree matrix, okay? And then let E of K be the embedding matrix at the kth layer. And again, the embedding matrix is simply each row stores an embedding of a, of a, uh, um, of a proper node. The difference uh, here between the GCN the original GCN formulation is that here there is no self connections, right? In the GCN, we added a self loop to every node. Here we don't, okay? And then each layer of GCN segregation can be written in the matrix form. This was that uh, lecture that, that I was uh, referring to, where basically you can take this uh, diffusion matrix um, embeddings uh, at a layer K, the, the weight matrix to transform the embeddings, send it through a nonlinearity, and you get embeddings at the next layer. So that's uh, kind of um, a matrix version of a graph neural network, where you work with the, the entire graph at once, and you propagate step by step from all the nodes using here basically what happens is neighborhood aggregation, right? Because you are taking a adjacency matrix and, and multiplying it with the embedding matrix. Um, and these are the learnable linear uh, transformations, right? So that's the, that's, the, that's the idea here. So what does now light GCN does? Light GCN says, if you are iterating this equation up there and you remove the nonlinearity, right? I, I had a ReLU here, now I removed it. And, and now my iteration says that E k plus 1 equals a tilde times ek times wk, right? Then the final, if I take this recursion and kind of expand it, 
then basically I say e of k is a tilde e k minus 1 times w k minus 1. So I can take this e k and throw it into that e k. So here is what I get, right? And now I can expand this and I get uh, uh, a tilde times a tilde times e k minus 2 uh, w uh, k minus 2 w k minus 1, okay? And you can see now that I can take this one and further uh, replace, uh, further kind of unfold my recursion, okay? And at the end, when I have unrolled this all the way to the zero, this is what I will get, okay? I'll get these multiplications of a tilde, k times, then I'll get the, the e0, the initial embeddings, and then I'll get these parameter matrices multiplied, uh, k, um, uh, multiplied together, okay? But what's the point? The point is that this a tilde, this is just a tilde raised to the power of capital K. This E0 are the embeddings. And all these parameter matrices don't really matter because I can just collapse them together into a single parameter matrix. Okay? So what this simplifies to, it simplifies to the following thing. It says that the embedding matrix at layer K is simply the uh, a tilde raised to the power k times initial embeddings times uh, parameter matrix w, okay? Um, and this basically means that I'm diffusing node embeddings along the graph in a similar way that what correct and smooth uh, did using the soft labels uh, in the graph. So what's the algorithm? Algorithm that these people are proposing is that you are simply running this iteration. You take E, multiply it with A tilde to get new E, put it here, A tilde, and so on, right? So each matrix multiplication diffuses the current embeddings to one hot uh, neighbors. And note, right, that A to the K is a dense um, matrix. So if I run this as an iteration, this A raised to the power of K never really gets materialized, right? So I don't have to materialize this a tilde raised to the power of k because this will become a very dense matrix because every power um, creates, uh, connects nodes that are two hops away. This was something I explained in the first second lecture, if you guys remember, okay? So um, this basically iter iterative matrix vector product uh, is useful to compute this expression, but much more scalable because I'm just doing this multiplication several times, okay? So this is uh, the basic version of this algorithm. What people do in reality is they call what they say multiscale diffusion, right? So what they say is they say let's, um, they say basically let's weigh uh, contribution from nodes that are farther out less than, fr than from the nodes that are close, okay? So the way they do it is they come up with these uh, weights alpha, alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, and so on. Um, and uh, this is now multi-scale because these uh, um, neighbors at different layers contribute different amount. Um, and this includes embeddings diffused at kind of multi-hop scales. Um, and this, uh, uh, you know, alpha, here is how you can write it out, right? Like alpha, alpha zero times E zero equals alpha zero, uh, uh, a tilde zero and uh, E zero acts as a, as a, as a self connection that, that is omitted in the definition of uh, a, a tilde. And the coefficients, this alpha zero to alpha k are hyperparameters. And what do people like to do? For example, just as a way to set this alpha parameters, like GCN uses this uh, uh, uniform coefficient where basically they say alpha k is just one minus uh, k plus one. So here, um, uh, um, uh, the, the, they would actually set the alpha to be, uh, to be, to be the same for all uh, alpha zero to alpha capital uh, k, okay? So uh, how does this work? Let me, uh, let me try to summarize this. So basically we are going to iteratively diffuse embed, uh, embedding matrix E using this A tilde matrix that I, that I discussed. Right? Um, so from little k going from zero to k minus one, I'm going to take the um, embedding, uh, the current embedding ma matrix, 
And then basically I'm going to multiply it with this normalized uh, adjacency matrix L uh, A tilde with self loop omitted to get the next level uh, embedding matrix. And then I'm going to put this uh, here and multiply again. And I'm going to iterate this uh, for uh, capital K uh, number of steps. Um, yes. Uh, two questions. The first one is, if you are Amazon and you have two, a billion products, how are you doing this? I mean, are you doing this matrix multiplication all in memory? And then the second one is, is, is this related, is this sort of like a generalization of the cat's matrix to the normalized adjacency matrix? Uh, two good questions. So the first question was uh, uh, about, uh, about scale. Um, yeah, multiplying big matrices is not a problem. Uh, uh, I don't know how to say. If you uh, take my class in the spring, uh, you'll see you can, you can multiply really, really huge matrices uh, uh, if need be. You can even use MapReduce and you can, uh, you can multiply the matrix describing the entire web and things like that. So, so, so this multiplication, yes, it's non-trivial, but you can, you can do. What becomes a bottleneck is, uh, is uh, storing these embeddings. But you can distribute them across machines. You can distribute parts of this matrix across machines. Y you know, you, you, you need some engineering, but, but it's very solvable. Um, and then the second question was about cuts. Is this similar to cuts? Yes, it's similar, right? It's similar in a sense that in cuts, we had these alphas as well, but they were decaying exponentially, right? And then there was this closed forum uh, that, that we discussed. Here, these uh, alphas are, um, uh, uh, you know, these people decided to choose it this way. Um, it's a good question why, it's a good question what would you do if you do, uh, if you do not light GCN but you do a cuts GCN. Um, it'd be cool to at least spend some time on Google Scholar and see if anyone has tried to do that. But it's, a good, it's an interesting question. So what? The authors propose here is that basically you store all these intermediate embedding matrices and at the end you just average them together, right? This is this uniform alpha, right? You just kind of average them together and that gives you your final, um, your final embedding matrix, okay? So that's the overview of this method where rather than iterating and taking the last one, you, you remember the intermediate ones as well and average them up into your uh, final embedding for the users uh, and for the, uh, for the items. And then, as I said, the score function um, is uh, simply a dot product. You take a user, you take an item, uh, you dot product the two vectors, and that will be, uh, that will be, uh, that will be your score, okay? So uh, that's about this uh, light GCN that is, um, kind of amazingly simple. You only take this adjacency matrix. You you uh, post process pre-process it using the degree matrix, um, and then you run and then you run the uh, and then you run the uh, you run the iteration, right? So the overview is you are given the um, uh, uh, adjacency matrix. You take this initial learnable uh, embedding matrix E, right? So I use the shallow embedding matrix C that I learned ahead of time. And then basically all I need to do is take the adjacency matrix, normalize it to this A tilde, and then multiply this learned embedding matrix with itself a couple of times and then average the results, right? So the light GCN in this respect is a post-processing step where in the first step I learn the shallow embeddings using the BPR loss or, or whatever, and then I um, I uh, propagate these embeddings uh, or uh, multiply them several times with the normalized adjacency matrix, average those resulting embedding matrices together to get kind of a better version of embeddings, right? So in this live GCN, there is no learning after I learned the initial embeddings, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the, that's the key idea here, um, right? And, you know, why does this simple diffusion uh, uh, propagation uh, work so well? Um, the answer is that diffusion directly encourages the embeddings of similar users' items uh, to be similar, right? So similar users share many common neighbors' uh, items, 
and are in this respect expected to have similar future preferences, which means that when you are um, aggregating these embeddings from similar users and averaging them, you are in some sense uh, uh, amplifying this similarity uh, between, between users. And you could make the same argument for items, is the two items are similar if uh, uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, users in common who interact with them. So that's the, um, that's the, that's the idea here. Um, I maybe want to just make a quick comparison to kind of situate the light uh, GCN and the original GCN and also the correct and smooth method and say what the differences were is that the embedding propagation in GCN is close, in, in light GCN is closely related to these other two methods. Um, and in GCN and correct and smooth, uh, the, way, the way we did it, we said that uh, in terms of propagation, when we sum over the, the neighbors, we normalize the embeddings by the one over the square root of, uh, um, of the product of the degrees of uh, nodes u and uh, uh, node, uh, node, um, uh, node v. Um, and we had the self loop to be kind of as part of this iteration. Um, the light GCN uses kind of a, the same equation, except that the self loop is not added in the neighborhood definition. Um, and final embedding takes the average from embeddings from all layers, right? So the final embedding is the sum of the individual layer embeddings, rather than saying the final embedding is the final layer embedding, right? So H of V is not H of V at capital K, but is a sum of H of V's for K's going from zero up to capital K. So those are the two, um, the two, key, uh, the two key differences. So um, with this, let me just um, summarize. Um, what this slide GCN did is it took this um, uh, neural graph convolutional filtering by, by basically removing the learning parameters of the GNN. Um, and uh, now all the learnable parameters are in the shallow uh, input uh, node embeddings. Um, and the diffusion propagation only involves matrix vector multiplica multiplication and the simplification leads to a bit better um, empirical performance. So that's what I wanted to say about um, kind of the, the core two methods that we wanted to talk about today. I'm now happy to, um, to take questions. Um, I see your hands. And what I'll do after the questions, I'll tell you about an industrial deployment uh, of GNNs for recommendation systems. It's called PinSage. Um, and this runs and was developed at Pinterest to, uh, to, a, to a huge success, I would say. So I can say more. Yes. Uh, is there an intuition why uh, the graph aware embeddings are better than the one hop embeddings? Because I think the intuition you provided, I didn't fully understand where the benefit is um, given that it's like a bipartite graph. It seems like even with one hop embeddings, you're getting like embeddings where the nodes are similar if their neighbors are similar. So is there an intuition for the type of graph aware feature that you might be interested in? Yes, good question. So why, why, does, this, why does this help? And the reason, the reason it helps is because it kind of smooths explicitly the embeddings across the graph a bit, right? And, and, and uh, your objective function kind of doesn't enforce any smoothness, right? Doesn't explicitly say, hey, you have to be similar because you are connected, right? It's, yes, there is some term, term in there, but there is a lot of other terms as well. While the, the, this smoothing uh, type things, they really kind of force um, embeddings to be, more, to be more similar across connections. So I would say in some sense, it's, you know, it smooths the data, it maybe denoises the data a bit, and that's why you get added, um, why you get uh, added benefit. It might be also that some users are very noisy, but you are still just training them based on their own data. But now because you take some other user, you kind of, the, the, the information, it stabilizes uh, the user itself. So it kind of averages the embeddings a bit across the graph, makes them more smooth, and actually makes them a bit more stable because of that. Uh, yes. 
Yeah, this idea of summing all your uh, h vectors of yeah. all layers can that um, is this like specific to this type of problem, or can that also be like transferred to previous prediction tasks? Um, yeah, because it doesn't seem like specific to this. Great task. question. Uh, great question. You so the question I'm repeating because I don't think yeah. people uh, online are hearing. Uh, the question was this uh, averaging of embeddings across layers. Um, uh, is different than what we've been do what we've been doing so far because we always said oh the embedding is the final layer embedding right um, and you are saying is this a general approach or is this some because it it's, doesn't look like it's related to recommender systems I would say yes you are correct you could try this strategy elsewhere as well originally it's been developed in the context of recommender systems and that's also um, where where uh, it gives uh, probably the best performance. But yeah, it's a more it's a more general idea. So that's a good observation. Anything else? Okay, so let me um, let me tell you about uh, uh, this uh, uh, PinSage or uh, Pinterest recommender system that's uh, graph based. Um, what is the idea? The idea is that um, given a query image you want to recommend related images or uh, related pins. Um, and the way you want to do this is that you want to create this embedding of a pin, right? And a pin is not just the image, it also includes, uh, it includes, it includes a description like you see here, and it also includes uh, the graph information. Um, and for a while, this was the largest industrial deployment uh, of GNNs. That, uh, that got hugely adopted across uh, all kinds of products and services across uh, Pinterest. Um, and uh, it, it, um, it, it allows you to basically both do uh, fresh content. So as soon as you, as a new, uh, con as a new pin is created, it's basically embedded in, in this uh, pin embedding space. And, and then these embeddings are consumed uh, down, the, down the line. Um, and uh, the, the core of this approach is, the, is a graph convolutional neural network. Um, and the goal is to create embeddings of nodes uh, in, in a large scale uh, Pinterest graph. And I'm going to explain with tens, hundreds of billions of objects. Um, and the key idea here was to really borrow information from nearby, uh, from nearby nodes. What happens if you only use um, visual information to train your, your models, then you make mistakes like this, right? You confuse a steel fence for a, for a rail of a bed. You confuse um, ground meat and soil. You confuse a, a rug and a tapestry. So you create these things that look visually the same but are semantically completely different. Um, so it is essential um, to have a high quality embedding that you can then use for a lot of different tasks for, you know, from search to ads to content safety and so on and so forth. So now, how, how, how was this built, right? What is the key um, component of what Pinterest users do is that they kind of, you can think of it as they, they are like looking at these images and they are uh, collecting them in different boards. So they are creating this bipartite graph between pins and boards. And board is just a collection of images, right? So, so maybe somebody's interested in uh, men's style, how to dress well, and they are browsing images and say, oh, I like this one, I like that one, then they add them together. And then some other user, you know, might be, might be also collecting how men can uh, dress well. And somebody else might be into plants, so they are collecting different arrangements of plants. And, uh, you know, somebody might be in architecture and so on and so forth. So we have billions of these boards where people kind of curate content. And especially if you're doing home remodeling, if you want to figure out how to, do a, how to throw a birthday party or something, usually people create a board and then browse and say, oh, these are ideas I like. It's almost like window shopping, okay? So in this graph, we have two types of nodes. We have the pins and we have these boards, right? And this is, and the link is that a pin belongs to a board and a same pin can belong to multiple boards. Um, and the graph has tens of billions of nodes and edges. Um, and the way we, we create an embedding of a node is that basically, especially of a pin, is that basically we have a GCN across this, across this graph, right? At the bottom layer, we are going to have 
um, um, embed embeddings or features of individual pins. This would be images and so on. But then we have a GCN that aggregates this. So what this means is that the embedding of a given pin will depend on uh, the embeddings of other pins that, that, are, uh, that it shares uh, boards with. And now you can basically back propagate into this GCN to learn how to optimally collect information from neighbors to, uh, to uh, create an embedding of a given object. And why does this help is because uh, uh, a garden fence is going to be, to be pinned with other garden fences. Some of those garden fences will really look like a garden fence. So even the garden fence that seems to look like a bed railing will collect you know, embeddings of other garden fences and say, hey, actually, I'm not a bed rail. I'm a, I'm a garden fence, right? And a bed will say, what am I pinned with? And it will be pinned with good looking beds. So that bed will say, hey, uh, you know, I'm truly a bed, right? So that's kind of the intuition. Uh, what's, uh, what's happening uh, here. And what's interesting in this, in this work is that um, uh, in addition to the model, the, the innovation, the paper introduces several methods to scale up G GCN to this billion, billion node scale and to the production workloads. And I'll give you a few examples. One was across uh, negative samples that there was a question earlier. Um, um, especially around hard negatives, curriculum learning, and also mini batch training of uh, GCNs, right? Uh, uh, usually people would have this matrix formulation of a GNN. This was one of the first papers that kind of said, hey, let's do the mini batch with the explicit uh, uh, sampling of the computation graphs uh, and learning over that. So the way this system was supervised was supervised on a, on, a, on a, in some sense, link prediction task, where the idea is that I want to recommend related pins to the user. So I have a query, I have a successful recommendation and an unsuccessful recommendation. And the objective function was that, you know, the distance between the, the query and the positive recommendation has to be smaller than the query um, and, the, and the sweater. So the, the GNNs will go this way, and then you know, here is where the score gets computed, and then back propagation goes through this kind of two tower uh, architecture. Um, in terms of training data, um, you know, this, was, this was a few years back, but even then they were training on over a, a billion, uh, over a billion uh, pairs. Um, and uh, here are some examples of uh, positive, uh, positive training examples, right? Um, and what's interesting is that sometimes, you know, um, they might be quite different, but they are related, right? This is about sea and this is, or this is sailors, here is navy, even though, you know, this is something to put on the door or something, and here's a mug, and so on and so forth. So they have um, a lot of examples of positive uh, training pairs. Um, one innovation to make this scale is this sharing of negative examples, right? That in a BPR loss, for every user in a mini batch, we sample one positive interaction and then uh, a set of negative uh, interactions. Um, and using more negative samples per user improves recommendation performance, but also slows down training because you have to create these negative examples over and over again. So, right, if you want to have some number of positive users, then for each one you need to create some number of negative examples, and this, this can become uh, quite expensive, okay? So um, what do they, what, what is the idea? Idea is that we can share the negative examples across all users in the mini batch. So the idea is that while positive examples are user specific, now the negative examples are, are the same for all the users uh, in the mini batch. This way, we only need to generate uh, 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 whatever is the number of negative examples uh, embeddings uh, for negative nodes, and we don't have to resample negative examples uh, every time for, uh, for each user. Um, and this saves a lot of node embedding generation, a lot of computation, uh, by basically the, the factor of the size of your uh, mini batch. Um, and empirically, empiric, uh, the performance stays about similar, um, but you have just sped up your computation by a, by a, by a, big, uh, by a big amount. So that's the first. And then the second one is this idea of 
um, hard negatives. And this goes to the questions I was getting earlier, right? That you basically, in these industry recommender systems, you need to make these extremely fine-grained predictions, right? You have billions of items, but then you only care about top 10, top 100. So um, the issue is that uh, shared negative examples, you know, in principle are randomly sampled from all users. So most of them are kind of easy negatives, right? It's so easy to, to recognize what's a positive example versus negative examples. So what you want to do is create this notion of a hard negative. And let me give you an idea, right? If this is a source, this is a query, and that's a positive example, right? Then if I just pick a random pin, you know, it's some random cottage somewhere, somewhere in the wood. It's very easy to say this is a positive pair and that's a negative pair. But if I, but this is an example of a hard negative example, right? It looks, so these are two, you know, thank you very much, you are special type of uh, cards. And this kind of looks like a card, but it's not. If you see, this is something you, you can put on a, on a desk uh, and it says happy birthday, right? So this is a hard negative example. And if I just have these random negatives, I'll be learning to make distinction between these two and that two, and that's very easy. So I'll never learn to the level to say, oh, actually, this is not related. This is very different, okay? So you have this notion of uh, hard negative examples. And the key insight is to apply this technique of um, curriculum learning where you make negative examples uh, gradually harder and harder as the process goes. So that the model kind of focuses on hard to distinguish parts of the space and really learns these fine-grained uh, distinctions. Um, I'll, uh, you know, there are a lot of heuristics how you set hard negative examples. At some point in time, they were saying, oh, let's look at, you know, something that is ranked at rank 2,000 to 5,000 and maybe say that those are negative examples. But the correct way to do this is this distance-based sampling. So here's the, I, here is the key plot that I want to show to you. So this is the distance between examples, right? Um, and if you do unif so this is distance zero and uh, you know this is kind of distance infinity think of it that way right if you do um, uniform sampling then basically most of the pins are unrelated so they'll be very far away so your you know your positive example is close but then this exists this gap and there's and then uh, there are your negative examples so if you do this hard negative examples that I showed you, then you, then you sample from this region. So you have a positive example, this region, and that region. Again, it's not good. So, um, but if you use this distance weight sampling, then you kind of sample your negatives along the entire distance spectrum. And that really makes the model learn best because you give it examples of all kinds of hardnesses rather than giving it super easy or super hard uh, examples. And if you do this, then you get really, really good results, right? So here's a query pin, and this is the visual embeddings nearest neighbors, and here are the graph-based uh, uh, nearest neighbors. And you can see how basically, you know, this is not bad, but this is definitely better, right? And you get some, you get some mistakes. So um, my last slide and then finish. So the, this pin sage uses GNN to generate high quality user and item embeddings that capture rich node attributes as well as uh, the graph structure. Um, the kind of the key innovation was scaling and the notion of negative sampling. Um, and, uh, um, you know, uh, if you, um, um, to, you know, uncovered topic of this lecture is how do we scale GNNs up to large scale? And I'm going to talk, uh, talk about this either, I think, in the next one or two lectures. So this is what's uh, yet coming. But uh, I hope you like the lecture. And um, thank you so much.